it's it's when you realize that there's there is evidence of um, techniques and tools that we use that simply do not match the things that we find in the archaeological record. Like there, there's 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 all sorts of evidence from all sorts of different angles that suggest that our our concept of 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 the earliest parts of our history are most likely incorrect. Our our idea of what the history of human civilizations is uh, is most likely incorrect. There's there's lots of angles and vectors that come at this problem and one of them happens to be the the technical evidence and the engineering evidence that's on sites the oldest sites that we know of in places like egypt uh you know it's and and that's i want to be clear that when i talk about like uh, you know rewriting history I, I i usually i'm talking about the very origins of human civilization as we know it we've got a pretty good grip on on things from about the times of the romans and the greeks and, and you know from then on right we've, mm -hmm. we've got a, a good understanding of it uh, it wasn't until that time, I think, mm. that that we started to have multiple sources that would that would uh, detail and record single events, so you can start to get corroboration through the story of history. But the further back you go, the the more muddy it gets. And this idea that civilization itself started only six thousand years ago, you know, with the Babylonians and Sumerians, uh, is is it's it's an antiqu it's an antiquated idea at this point. It's it is still the mainstream picture of history. Uh, but there has been so much, and it's it's been that picture, it's been that story for probably about a hundred years. Like our idea of when civilization started, around six thousand years ago, and we were all Stone Age before that, has been in place for probably a century or more now. And I mean, at least from the age of Enlightenment and the age of reason, uh, as that as that started to grow. But there's been so much development, so many new discoveries, and so many adjacent sciences to to history itself that have made discoveries and, and, and really pushed this field back. They should be having an impact on the story of history, but they don't. Uh, so that's, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the angles that I, I like to take on it. And one of the, the particular elements of that, that I'm fascinated with is the, the technological evidence that suggests that there was something else going on a long time ago. And there's another model that fits our model of, of particularly the Egyptian civilization, but also that of South America and Easter Island and Turkey and a few other places and it's an inheritance model. This idea that these civilizations didn't just emerge out of the Stone Age from nowhere and immediately peak and immediately build the greatest pyramids and, and things we've ever seen that are still standing, which is today the story, right? With the, the, all the, the greatest works of Egypt are, are the Old Kingdom works mm. that happened in the earliest parts of their civilization and they kind of declined forever since then. That doesn't make any sense from a technological perspective. So that that ever look at our civilization as a as a technological evolution. Like we we have we have ramped up to space shuttles and 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 space flight. And you know uh, we you know we we it takes time to develop that capability. But when we look at places like Egypt, it's it's the inverse. It's like they peaked early from out of nowhere apparently, and then dipped off. And there's another model that works really well to explain that, and it's it's an inheritance model. So it's the idea that. Maybe they didn't start with nothing. Maybe they inherited some of these concepts, some of their artwork, some of their objects, their architecture, their right. their their <clears throat> artifacts. For people who, real quick, for people who aren't familiar with uh, your videos and your story and the overall uh, scholar scholarly timeline, that's basically the mm -hmm. the the known narrative that's taught in school books and textbooks. What is the like 30,000 foot overall accepted view of history as we know it? So as, according the accepted view of history is that we have been in uh, the Stone Age up until around 6,000 years ago. So, you know, call it 4,000, between four and 5,000 BC uh, was when we started this. Is, and this is the, the, the standard model, if you like. That's when we started to develop things like agriculture and organized society and civilization itself began to begin. So prior to that time, human beings were just hunter gatherers like like stone age technology we were we weren't organized in any way and so once this we started, was like 200,000 years ago right no no okay, no, okay. no well stone age yes stone so, age, so yeah. that's the idea of civilization itself is only 6000 or so years old like the the uh, as long as humans have existed before that the idea is that no we were just stone age hunter gatherers now that mm. that may have made sense when we were considered to be maybe 50,000 years old as a species we uh we um and that was the case we thought we were around fifty thousand years old for a long time and then some discoveries were made that that put the human like human remains were found that you know anatomically correct and modern human beings w were there from about one hundred and fifty thousand years old years ago sorry and then mm -hmm. recently in, in the last is one of those discoveries that should really have an impact on history 
is that in the last 10 years there's been there's been human remains like anatomically correct human remains found in Morocco that date homo sapiens us back to around 300,000 years old so you know you you have to once you get into that range of say 300,000 years old and here's another thing that to throw that out there again new science that should be impacting the story of history uh, genetic evidence the dna evidence shows that that us and neanderthals split from a common ancestor somewhere in the realm of 800 to 900,000 years ago so that's that's what i would consider the the range of possibility for human timeline so mm. for sure we've got human remains 300,000 years old we may have been here up to 800 to 900,000 years ago and for all of that time you, you're going back you're not talking it's not like planet snowball back in that time we've got warm periods you know, periods of where there would have been plenty and like the same type of anatomically correct modern thinking human beings getting together. And it's not, we, we start to solve problems. Like we do develop civilization and develop like problem solving capabilities generation by generation. So it's, it's kind of hard to think that at the, only at the very tiny tippy end of, of that whole period, let's say 300,000 years long, only the last 6,000 years has been the development of civilization. That's the standard model. Right. And basically what you have found specifically going into places like Egypt is that the, the, the narrative of Egypt alone is that from the start of Egypt until the end of the ancient, uh, what is the, the last uh, civilization that was in Egypt was the, uh, the old kingdom or? No, well, the, the, I guess they, they would call it the new kingdom and then the Greco-Roman yeah. period. The Romans right. essentially took it over. Cleopatra was the last kind of Cleopatra Egyptian was like the last, yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. So essentially what you have discovered there is that um some of the things when you look into engineering and the way that some of these stones were cut and moved don't fit the timeline with what is accepted to be their advancement technologically with tools because right. they only had copper tools and chisels right. and some of the stones that you found in your videos that you show were clearly cut by like a very, very high precision blade or something like that. Cause they, they produce perfectly smooth surfaces like you would see in somebody's kitchen on, on their granite countertop. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, some surfaces end up that way. Yeah. So it's the, the technological evidence and, and we can come back. There's lots of other sort of supporting evidence for, for this hypothesis. And I should say too, it's not necessarily my discovery. Uh, a lot of people notice this, particularly engineers. Anyone like Chris Dunn is probably the most well known because mm. he actually published on it. He's an engineer, but I've taken and been in Egypt with many engineers, and they just shake their heads and and almost almost uniformly, engineers, the people that know, stonemasons, stone workers, engineers, construction guys, will tell you that there is no way that these finishes and these these um, the stones and the and the artifacts that we see in Egypt could have been accomplished with the tools that we know the dynastic Egyptians used. So the, the real problem is, is we, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the tools and the techniques that are in the archeological record, all the depictions that we have where the Egyptians show them working on, on certain things. So in the early days, yeah, all they had was copper and they had pounding stones. It's, it's a misnomer. The copper chisels is kind of a, a bit of a joke at this point um, because obviously copper and bronze itself won't do anything to granite, but they did have flint, they had mm. pounding stones. So there are ways that you can use other stone material to, to, to shape harder stones like that. Um, and they even give you, like, if you go visit there, they'll even give you some of these pounding, pounding stones and let you, like, practice hitting yeah. these big rocks. In the quarry at Aswan, yeah, where there's, a, there's literally a 1,200 ton obelisk still in its bed um, that hasn't been detached from the bedrock and it's was supposed to have been lifted up and used as, a, as, an, as an obelisk. And supposedly it was shaped by, uh, yeah, pounding stones. And in fact, there's been some experiments and a lot of, I, I like to look at all sides of the, the argument and there have been experiments by mainstream Egyptologists like Mark Lane and Zahi Was uh, that tried to show that that was the technique that was used. But even in those experiments, they had to resort to using bulldozers and power tools mm. and, and modern techniques to do anything. It's one of the things that I have a, that I'd like to talk about when it, that, that annoys me about this is that there's amongst all of the naysayers, uh, the people that say, oh, no, that definitely the Egyptians could have done it this way. They could have just, instead of using like circular saws and, and some sort of form of power tool to cut uh, the blocks of basalt and granite, which is what the evidence suggests, they'll say, no, no, it was just done with grinding. They, they would grind it with a copper bar and sand and water, and they would just sit there and grind through it. And there's been, so there's been experiments done to see how long that would take. 
And uh, but not in amongst that, they, they'll cut like a couple of inches over a period of days and days and days of work. And as far as I know, this is the 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 crazy thing is that not a single block has been fully cut. Not a single box has ever been formed. We've not replicated a single object in its entirety that we see from ancient Egypt. But we're claiming that these are the tools and techniques that 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 we use to to make them.